So even though in the wilderness with all the murmuring and the grumbling and the complaining and whining, God still saw to it that these children did not lack that same God that that same God that delivered Israel uh, from Egypt is the same God we have here today and I think there's some of us who can testify that despite a few rough spots that we've been through God has seen us through so that we haven't lacked amen there is no lack with God Praise the Lord. God is good. Yes, 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 yes. The first day of the month, first day of a great month, August. You may be seated. You may be seated. I want to first of all recognize Pastor Jason and honor Pastor Asia. They are relentless in their commitment in pursuing an on-time, fresh, now word for us. We are blessed as a church to have them as pastors and shepherds of the house amen want to recognize my wife we've been kicking it for 27 years we got married when she was three yep she was three years old when we got married because right now she's only about 30 so she's been with through thick and thin so these days everybody wants to know who they are and where they come from you have DNA testing sites to show you the ethnicity and what percentage of what ethnicity you are. You have Ancestry.com to show you, you know, what is your family tree, your family line. So there was this zebra that also wanted to find out who he was. He couldn't get onto Ancestry.com, but he tried his best as he wandered around the fruited plain to ask all the other zebras, you know, am I a zebra that is black with white stripes? Or am I a zebra that is white with black stripes? Nobody could give him an answer. So one day he died and went to heaven. Everybody say, ah. So on getting to heaven, he met with St. Peter at the pearly gates. And he says, St. Peter, I have a question that I've been burning to get the answer to all my life. And nobody has been able to answer it. And St. Peter said, what's the question? He says, St. Peter... Am I black with white stripes or am I white with black stripes? St. Peter looks at him and scratched his head and says, uh, you're going to have to ask God himself for that one. So later on that afternoon, the zebra ran into God. After all, it's heaven and God is everywhere. So he says, God, please, please, I've got this question I need to know. And God says, what is it? He says, am I black with white stripes or am I white with black stripes. And God looks at him in his infinite love and his infinite wisdom and says, you are who you are. <laughs> and the zebra was like, okay, okay, okay. So a few days later, the zebra ran into St. Peter and St. Peter called out to him and says, hey, zebra, did you get your answer from God? Well, kinda. He says, what did God say? He says, well, he just says, you are who you are. You are. And then St. Peter says, well, there you have it. You are white with black stripes. And the zebra looked at him and says, well, how do you know? How can you be so sure? He says, well, if you are black with white stripes, God would have said, you is what you is. <laughs> so let us pray. Let us pray. <laughs> Bow your heads, please. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. We bless you because you are the King of kings and the Lord of all lords. For these few moments, we ask that your word will come forth like a hammer to pierce asunder, even deep into the souls. We ask, Lord, that it shall be all you and none of me. Speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind, I pray, in the name of Jesus. I come against any distractions, any diversions, and ask that your unadulterated word will come forth and not return to you void in the name of Jesus. And all the saints said, Amen. Amen. So we're going to start off in Genesis, but um, today I want to share with you something very simple. Nothing complicated, nothing deep, nothing theological. Something very, very simple. 
okay? Some, and I pray that you will be stirred up enough to see the true heart of God concerning this area because it's often messed up and often confused. And that is God is a God of no lack. Why don't you say that with me? Two words, no lack. God is a God of no lack. See, I have a confession. I never really wanted to become a Christian. Surprising. Why? Because all the Christians I knew were Christians that operated in this area of lack. I remember being uh, witnessed to by one of my college classmates. He says, oh, you need to become a Christian. And I looked around and I looked at the Christians, that then the so-called quote-unquote Christians, and they were all operating in lack. And I thought to myself, I grew up in lack. I knew what lack was, having to go without. And I said, I don't want to be part of any kind of a religion that's going to preach lack and intensify the lack that I had been suffering. So I was like, no, I don't want anything to do with lack. But praise God, he did not give up on me. And he gave me the revelation to show that he is a God of no lack. See, I had that limiting belief that to be the more lack you had, the more holy you were. How wrong I was. Anyway, so everyone here that, you know, thinks God is a God of lack, I pray that today you'll have a change of heart and then you'll see who God is truly. Okay? So let's go over to the book of Genesis. And I want to talk about a certain man called Adam and a certain woman called Eve. I like to fondly refer to them as the quintessential couple that had it all. They were bawling in heaven, in the Garden of Eden. They did not need anything. So if you go over to the book of Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to start from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And if this scripture sounds familiar, you would have heard it last week when Pastor Uwaga was talking about framing uh, your world. But basically the world was without form, it was void, and it was dark. Then over the next six days, God said, let there be. Let there be light. And to summarize from verse 3 to the end, he said, let there be light, let there be day and night. Let there be land and sea, let there be the plants, let there be fish, animal, and birds. And you skip down to 29, I want you to notice what God does here in verse 29 of Genesis 1. He says, and God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields its seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields its seed. To you it shall be for food. Also every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything and he, that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now please notice that Everything had been prepared and provided before the arrival of Adam and Eve. God made sure that there was no lack before Adam and Eve came on the scene. There was nothing that Adam and Eve could have ever wanted because it was all prepared. And the good thing is that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same he did back then for Adam and Eve is the same that he desires for you and I today. God did not design or plan for you to come into this world to live in lack. God is a good, good father. And even regular parents, at least most of them that I know, when you find out that you are expecting a child, you begin to prepare. Your desire is that they do not get born into lack. Amen? But if you have been on planet for more than 10 minutes, you know that there is an adversary called the enemy. And the enemy has a problem. The enemy does not like to see the children of God enjoying the fulfillment and the goodness of what God has for them. So the enemy comes in and tries to introduce a concept called lack. Bible says he steal, kills, and destroys. So in Genesis 3, we see that along comes the enemy with all his slick bag of tricks, and he manages to tempt Adam and Eve uh, to, to disobey God by eating the forbidden fruit. 
All of a sudden, they find themselves kicked out of heaven and experiencing for the first time lack. In Genesis 3, verse 23, it says, Therefore the Lord sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed a cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every which way to guard the way of the tree of life. And there you have it, falling from full abundance into lack. So what is lack? Lack, a lot of times people refer to lack in terms of finances and resources. Now that is not entirely wrong, it's just that it's incomplete. See, lack is a state of being without or not having enough of something. Lack covers a whole spectrum of inadequacy and in every area that you can think of. You can lack health, you can lack wisdom, you can lack understanding, you can lack peace, you can lack joy, you can lack time, you can lack skill, and yes, you can lack common sense. How many people run into people who lack common sense every day? <laughs> lack means a shortcoming, a shortfall, not enough, a reduction, a poverty, a shortage, an absence, a deficiency, insufficiency, depletion, decrease, and a drought. But the good news is that God is a God of no lack. His name is El Shaddai, the many-breasted God, the unlimited supplier, the one who supplies all our needs according to his riches in glory. God is not a God of lack. He is a God that is more than enough. As Psalmist says in Psalm 23, my cup runs over. There is no lack in God. So I want to take a minute just to explore and to look to see how God feels about lack. You know, how does God relate or react to lack? Is lack really a concern for God? So we're going to go through the Bible and strap on your seatbelts. We're going to do some rapid-fire scripture. I just want to lay a good foundation so you know where I'm uh, coming from. Genesis in chapter 1 and verse 22 says, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on earth. Right off the bat, the very first commandment that he gave to earth, I mean to, to man on earth, he says, be fruitful and multiply. God is not about the lack life. He wants everything to be increased and filled up. Okay? There is no lack with God. We know the story of the children of Israel who were in bondage for over 400 years and God sent Moses to save them. The only thing is we had a very stubborn Pharaoh who did not want to let them go. But finally, after 10 plagues, he had to let them go. But check this out in Exodus chapter 12, verse 35. It says, now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. And they had asked the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So that they granted them what they requested as they plundered the Egyptians. Now that word plunder in modern vernacular means the word loot. And I think that's the only place you would legally <laughs> see where you're allowed to loot. We, uh, in the old Pentecostal church, we used to sing a song. We went to the enemy's camp and we took back what he stole from us. Verse 37 says, the children of Israel journeyed to Ramesses, from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. A mixed multitude went up with them also, look at this, and flocks and herds and a great deal of livestock. God wanted to make sure that they left Egypt without lack. They were delivered with stuff. It's one thing for you to be delivered, but then with stuff as well. God said, do not leave empty-handed. In Psalm 105, 37, it says, he brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. In other words, they were loaded up with strength and loaded up with substance. Why? Because there is no lack with God. God knows exactly where you are and what you are going through. In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 2, chapter two uh, verse 7, it says, For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He knows you're trudging through the great wilderness these 40 years. God has been with you, and you have lacked nothing. 
So even though in the wilderness with all the murmuring and the grumbling and the complaining and whining, God still saw to it that these children did not lack. That same God that, that, same God that delivered Israel uh, from Egypt is the same God we have here today. And I think there's some of us who can testify that despite a few rough spots that we've been through, God has seen us through so that we haven't lacked. Amen? There is no lack with God. Let's talk about the disciples for a minute. Sometimes lack manifests in how we think. Jesus, wants to make, Jesus wanted to make sure that these people didn't have a lack mentality in their thinking. Luke chapter 9 from verse 1, it says, Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all the demons to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey. Neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you, when you go out to the city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now, I wanted to know how this story ends. They went out with nothing, nothing, not even a change of clothing. If you look at Luke chapter 22, verse 35, it says, And he said to them, When I sent you out without a money bag, without a knapsack, without sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, nothing. So when it comes to God, there is always a provision for his vision. Lack isn't what you don't have. Lack is who you don't have. There is no lack with God. Another area the disciples were tested in their lack thinking was in the story of the five loaves and the two fishes. The, fish, the two-piece fish meal. In Luke chapter 9, verse 12, it says, Late in the afternoon, the 12 disciples came to him and said, Send the crowds away to the nearby villages and the farms so that they can find food and lodging for the night. There is nothing to eat here in this remote place. But Jesus said, you feed them. But we only have five loaves and, of bread and two fish. And they answered, oh, are you expecting us to go buy food for this whole crowd? For there are about 5,000 men there. That's plus the women and the children. See, the disciples had a lack mentality. All they saw was not enough. Jesus replied and said, tell them to sit down in groups of 50 each. So the people sat down. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread, to the, and, uh, he kept giving the bread and the fish to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted. It was an all-you-can-eat buffet. And afterwards, disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. Not only were they all fed, there was an excess. You see, if we had stuck with the mentality of disciples, those 20,000 people, the 5,000 men plus the women and children, would have experienced some serious lack and hunger. But there's no lack with God. There was a young man in the Bible named David, and David went against a giant named Goliath. And you might be thinking, what is David and Goliath, one of my favorite Sunday school stories, by the way, what does David and Goliath have to do with lack? See, the Bible says that David ran towards Goliath. He had no lack in confidence in facing this giant. Yeah, First Samuel, I was just looking for what the scripture was. First Samuel 17, uh, verse 48, it says, so it was. When the Philippines arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and hurried, hurried, and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. And as he was running, David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead. So the, sa the stone sank deep into the forehead and his fell face, he fell on his face to the earth. You see, if you have any Goliaths that are threatening you with lack, take a stone. And let it rip. There is no lack with God. Lack also relates to your ability as a child of God. Paul writing to the Philippian church, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
Paul was just writing to say that there is no lack in my ability of what I can do through Christ. Later on in uh, the same chapter, he says, um, in verse 18, it says, I have all and I abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you as a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Apostle Paul lived in a realm of no lack. Why? Because there is no lack with God. God knows that you cannot fulfill his burden, you can fulfill his, his, his calling with a burden of lack. Okay? So in Deuteronomy 8, 18, it says, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Thank you. There you go. No, I'll, keep, I'll keep going. So we could fulfill his covenant. As he saw, you see, God wants you wealthy and without lack so that his covenant can be established. There is no lack with God. And this next scripture, <laughs> I'm sure the enemy was, 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 was not happy that I found it because I've been praying this thing and I've been seeing the manifestation. It's in the book of Deuteronomy, and I would encourage you to pray it as well. Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 11. It says, and may the Lord, the God of your ancestors multiply you a thousand times more and bless you as he has promised. You see, if you take what you have and multiply it by a thousand, it would definitely eliminate a whole bunch of lack. In fact, just do this with me. If you just close your eyes for a second, and I want you to add up what you have in your checking account and in your savings account and multiply it by a thousand. You don't have to shout out that number. But I can guarantee you that that number will take care of a whole bunch of lack. Probably take care of your house payment, your car payment, a couple of decent cars. <laughs> Think of all the missionaries and the ministries that you can assist just being a thousand times more. There's no lack with God. When God brings you into a place, his ultimate desire is, not, is for you not to experience lack. In Genesis 45, verse 10, it says, You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children, your flocks and your herds and all that you have, there I will provide for you. You see, in real estate, you hear the, the phrase location, location, location. But as a child of God in the kingdom of God, basically it's wherever God is, that is where there is no lack. See, lack and God cannot exist together. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 7, it says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, a land of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land which you will eat bread without scarcity or without lack, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and whose hills you can dig copper. Reminds me of the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve got chucked out of. Nothing missing, no lack. I know there are places that are poverty-stricken, and I know places that are plagued with lack. Yes, I'm not disagreeing to that. Is it God's will? No. God wants there to be fullness, wants there to be no lack. In, book, uh, in Psalms 37, it says, the Lord knows the days of the upright. Psalms 37 and verse 18. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and the inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. In other words, they shall have no lack. So it doesn't matter whether there's a famine, a pandemic, whether there's a recession or high gas prices. God is not, it is no part of God's nature that wants you to experience uh, any lack. So I came across a story, which I'm going to read, actually. It's a, it's a nice lengthy story. I'm going to read it word for word because I don't want to miss out any parts at all. And this was a time in the second half of the 18th century here in the United States of America, in the state of Minnesota, where there was a severe lack. And this lack was caused by, guess what? Grasshoppers. 
For those of us with any farming experience, you know the havoc that a few bugs can wreak, wreak on your crops. So, I call it the Great Grasshopper Invasion of Minnesota. On June 12, 1873, the farmers in, a southwestern, Minnesota, in southwestern Minnesota saw what looked like a snowstorm coming towards their fields in from the west. Then they heard the roar of beating wings and saw that what seemed to be snowflakes were in fact grasshoppers. In a matter of hours, fields of grass and wheat were eaten to the ground by the hungry grasshoppers. The grasshoppers' dramatic descent was just the beginning. For five years, from 1873 to 1877, the grasshoppers destroyed wheat, corn, oats, barley fields in Minnesota and all the surrounding states. In 1876 alone, the grasshoppers visited 40 Minnesota counties and destroyed over half a million acres of crops. The grasshoppers were not new to Minnesota, but in the past, they had only stayed for a short while. But in 1873, they moved into Minnesota from the Dakotas and from Iowa, and they laid their eggs deep inside the soil. The farmers did their best to destroy the grasshoppers, grasshopper eggs so there would be fewer grasshoppers to feast on their crops the next year. But 1874 was even worse than 1873. The grasshopper eggs hatched and more grasshoppers flew in from the west. Each year until 1877, the grasshoppers spread further and deeper into Minnesota. They advanced in racks and moved in separate units, destroying large sections, sections of crop in their wake. The Minnesota farmers tried everything to get rid of the grasshoppers. They beat the grasshopper with flails. They dragged heavy ropes through the fields. They plowed and burned their fields. They raised birds and chickens to eat the grasshoppers. They dug ditches that they hoped with the grasshoppers would be unable to jump over. They filled these ditches with coal tar and set them on fire, thinking that the smoke might drive away the grasshoppers if the ditches didn't. In the later years, farmers had sheet metal covered in coal tar and molasses, and they dragged these through the fields, catching grasshoppers in pans and then emptying the pans into the fires, but none of these were successful. The crops diminished and the whole state experienced more and more lack as time went on. The county, governments the county governments tried their best efforts to rid the state of grasshoppers and to help destitute farmers, but the counties fell short, not even making a dent in the pestilence problem. Especially in the vast rural areas, the charitable organizations ran out of money, labor, and resources. Even the state fell short and failed to provide adequate relief to the affected farmers. Two governors were elected and kicked out of office because they were unable to bring any tangible relief. Then along came Governor John S. Pillsbury. He was elected into office in 1876 and he had a different approach to the challenge. Amongst other things, he listened to the requests of the church. And on April 26, 1877, he declared a day of fasting and prayer. Some scoffed at him, saying, can God deal with grasshoppers? Nevertheless, the people prayed. Now, the grasshoppers had not yet hatched, but folks were, were getting nervous, as they knew that it would soon be time for the nasty critters to appear. That's a grasshopper calling. <laughs> After the day of prayer, something strange happened. It started to get very warm, unusually so. And for those who are into entomology, those who study insects, you know that when there's a warm ground, it speeds up the hatching of the eggs. As you would know, the warm temperature sped up the hatching of the eggs, and soon the ground was covered with hungry grasshoppers. Even more than before, they literally covered the earth. The prayers didn't seem to do much. Has anybody been there where you pray and fast for something and not only does it not happen, but the, actual, the exact opposite starts to happen? The county governors tried their best efforts in the state of, of, of governors then, then um, yeah, I'm sorry. They literally covered the earth. Basically, all of a sudden, it then, all of a sudden, it turned cold, very cold. And a heavy snowstorm came in and froze hard every grasshopper. It froze the ground hard and every grasshopper died. Yeah. 
The cold was even severe enough to kill the eggs that hadn't hatched. That year, the grasshoppers did not trouble them. And by the summer of 1877, they were gone. Yes, God can deal with grasshoppers. But my question this morning is, what grasshoppers are eating your stuff and causing you lack? You have tried everything, saving money, two jobs, three jobs, part-time, side hustle, but yet you still have lack. You've tried losing weight, exercising, skipping meals, this diet, this potion, this lotion, this prescription pill, but yet you are still lacking in health. You have tried counseling, pleading, reasoning, date night, vacation, gifts, but yet your relationship is still lacking peace. Those evil grasshoppers are still there causing lack. God is not into lack. He desires and is well able to deliver. There is no lack with God. So today I serve notice for those who are going through a rough season of grasshoppers that all that, that, and that, that, that are eating their stuff and causing lack that God Almighty will restore in the name of Jesus. The prophet Joel says this in Joel 2, 25. It says, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the years that the crawling locust has eaten, the years that the consuming locust and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent amongst you. So in other words, it doesn't matter what type of lack that you are experiencing, what type of lack that you are going through or where it came from. Restoration is your portion. Verse 26, it says, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Because it's amazing when you are in lack, close by is a shadow of shame. But I want to go back to verse 23 in that chapter 2 of Joel. And this is, just check this out. It says, be glad then you children of Zion. And rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully. He will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And that's a whole other sermon, how you can get double in one month. The threshing floors, verse 24, shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So check this out. Wheat, wine, and oil. Okay? Wheat, wine, and and oil, a bountiful harvest. Now, if you know anything about dead, decomposing grasshoppers, grasshoppers are full of protein. Protein is full of nitrogen. Nitrogen is what's used as fertilizer. Those dead, decomposing grasshoppers actually served as fertilizer for the bountiful harvest of wheat, oil, and wine. So it's like this. In other words, God will take your trash and turn it into treasure. He is able to take your mess and turn it into a message. Whatever hell that you have been going through, he will turn it into a harvest. Amen. In fact, let's do this. Let's, let's do this right now. Some of us, I feel, have some grasshoppers that have been eating their stuff. So I want you to take a look at the grasshopper and say, hey, grasshopper, hey, grasshopper. you're going to die and become my fertilizer. For my harvest. <laughs> Let me do that one more time. It says, hey, grasshopper. Hey, grasshopper. You're going to die. And become fertilizer. become fertilizer. For my harvest. For my harvest. Amen. Amen. There is no lack with God. So earlier on, I mentioned that I didn't want to become a Christian because I saw too much lack. I had to learn that basically God does not want his children to suffer lack. It's just that the enemy has deceived so many into living into life, just like he deceived Adam and Eve out of their portion in the Garden of Eden. So there's a way to walk in no lack. Anybody interested? Let's go over to the book of Psalm chapter 1, the very first psalm. And we have a clue there. Psalm chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, blessed, blessed, blessed. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water 
that brings forth his fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does prospers. There is no lack when you're able to meditate in God's will, in God's word, day and night. In Psalm 34, it says, oh, taste and, uh, verse 8, it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for there is no want or lack to those who fear him. It says the long, young lions will, will lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord, nothing will not lack any good thing. So when you fear the Lord and when you seek the Lord, nothing will be lacked. In the book of Proverbs um, chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, this sounds like an offering verse, but I want you to look at this verse as a lifestyle. You see, there's two ways to look at stewardship. Two ways a Christian can view his resources. One is how much of my money shall I use for God? The second way is how much of God's money shall I use for myself? See, God owns everything. Not only does he own the cows on a thousand hills, but he also owns the thousand hills as well. We're going to be delivered from lack. Amen? In the book of Joshua, chapter 18 and verse 2, it says, now the way, so you walk in um, no lack. Joshua chapter 18 and verse 2, it says, But there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. Now, not yet received means they were lacking. They hadn't received their healing. They haven't received their deliverance. They haven't received what was due to them, the provision. Verse 3, Joshua said to the children of Israel, How long will you neglect and go and p- to go and possess the land which the Lord your God of our fathers has given to you? So check this out. God had already given them their portion. But they had been slack and they neglected and they had been inactive in going to possess it. Tell your neighbor, get your stuff. That's why you're in lack. Get your stuff. See, when God says something in the Bible, I want to be quick to believe it and receive it, not slack. And I've seen Christians who have either let what they have learned slip away or they've been slow to act on a promise that God has for them. I have, um, a while back, remember when all the stimulus checks were going out? I have four employees. Two of them got their stimulus checks. The other two didn't. You should have seen how these two were going after their stimulus check. They knew that stimulus checks were in the atmosphere. <laughs> but they hadn't, it hadn't hit their accounts. They were calling the IRS, emailing and checking to see how come they hadn't gotten their stimulus check. And I'm thinking if you're a Christian, in the Bible, there's a stimulus package that is so much more than any little stimulus check that we're just leaving out there. If we had the same hunger as these two dear employees were looking for their stimulus check. As check that, I would guarantee you'll be gone in two days, two weeks, two months, if it would survive that. Yet this is eternity. Do not neglect what is yours. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 7, it says, The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Lack is your enemy. It will flee before you. The Lord will command a blessing on you in your storehouses and into all which you set your hand. He will bless you in the land which the Lord God has given you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself just as he has sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. It is a promise. And check out verse 10. It says, then all the peoples of the earth. There's a reason why God does not want you in lack. Then all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord. And they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you, check these things, plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, the increase of your livestock, and the produce of your ground in the land which the Lord, your fathers, would give to you. So wrapping up, basically, I was going to go back into Genesis Where the earth had no form, it was void, and it was dark. There was huge lack. 
God cannot stand lack. That's why he had his spirit hover over it. But the reality is some of us are going through that in our lives today where there is no form, there is we lack structure, we have a void, there's emptiness, we lack fulfillment, and when there's darkness, we lack light or revelation. And notice how God solved this issue. He said the Spirit of the Lord hovered over and then God speak. The good thing is we have a mouth that we can speak. The Holy Spirit is there, but it's our turn to speak as well. We had a powerful word last week on how to speak to frame your word. And that's a good place to start. If you haven't already started framing your word, your world, this is a good place to start. Coming against lack, coming against those grasshoppers. See, God has been trying for ever since to get us back to a state of no lack. A state of nothing missing and a state of nothing broken. The good news is that God is who he is. A God of no lack. And yes, it doesn't matter whether you're a zebra, confused about whether you have black stripes or white stripes. You have the stripes of Jesus. And you're a child of God. Therefore, lack is not your portion. So I want us all to stand to our feet and I'm going to pray this word through. Hallelujah. No lack. If you close your eyes and bow your heads, there's uh, a few people I want to mention. First of all, you're here today. And you experience lack in any way, shape, or form. You have grasshoppers that have been affecting you. Eating up your stuff. Eating up your peace. All eyes closed. Heads bowed. I just want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand. If you're here and you know that you have lack in some way, shape, or form. You can put those hands down. The second set of people I want to pray for is if you're here today and you have a close family member. And you know that they've been experiencing lack. You see them trying everything like those farmers were trying with the grasshoppers. And yet, they are still deep in lack. And you want to stand before, before them. You want to stand on their behalf and, and, and uh, intercede. I want to join my faith with yours and pray for them. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand on behalf of that family member. And as you raise your hand, I want you to very quietly say their name. So we can stand in agreement. I want you to put their name out into the spirit, into the atmosphere. And you can put those hands down. I see your hands. You can put those hands down. But thirdly and most importantly, before we pray, there is a lack that is greater than any other lack than we can think of. And this is the lack of salvation. So if you are here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you are here today, and at one time you knew him, but you backslid or you went back backwards. I want to pray for you as well. If you would be so bold to raise your hand too. All those at home too. This goes to you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This could be all family here. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, basically. For all of those who are experiencing lack and those who have family members, close family members that you know are in lack. Just stand in agreement with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you because you are a God of no lack. Thank you for leading us out of lack. We invite you to hover by your Holy Spirit in any areas of lack in our lives and in the lives of those who are close to us. We call forth structure, fulfillment, and light where there's been emptiness, darkness, and confusion. We thank you for giving us everything that we have need of. We rebuke every form of attack and every deception from the enemy that is trying to cause lack in our lives. We come against bad habits, generational curses, addictions, fears of any sort. We rebuke every grasshopper spirit trying to eat up our stuff. Forgive us, Lord, where we have brought lack even upon ourselves. Lord, we lay hold of what is due to us right now. Thank you, Lord, for being able to do, for us being able to do all things through Christ who strengthens us. 
we are delivered from all forms of disability. We call forth a thousandfold blessing in the name of Jesus. Thank you for full satisfaction, regardless of the pandemic, regardless of what's going on. We give you praise this day in the name of Jesus. And all the saints said, Amen. Give God some praise. There is no lack in God. Amen. Were you blessed this morning? No lack. Praise the Lord. God is good. Father, we thank you for this message this morning, God. We thank you, Lord, that you are all in it and spoke to us, O oh Lord. Were, were you so fed, God? Father, we are holding on to the promises of your word, God. And we are standing strong in every way in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we are, we are doing exactly what you've called us to do. So Lord, we thank you and we bless you. We pray for an awesome day, God. Lead and guide us in every way. We bless you and praise you in all that we do and say. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome day today. God bless. I am so excited that you accepted the Lord as your personal savior. You're probably thinking, where do I go next? Listen, we have a booklet that we want to send you that will help you with your walk with Christ. So please go and click the link in the description to receive more information. We'll see you very soon. God bless.